Trends in Supply Chain Network Strategy is a topic of my conversation today with Rich Thompson. He is International Director of Supply Chain and Logistics Solutions with JLL, Jones Lang LaSalle. Hi, Rich. Hi, Bob. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being with me. Rich, what are the big trends you see right now in supply chain network strategy? Well, I, I've been doing this for over 30 years, and it's very interesting to me how everything remains the same, but it, it's always changing. So uh -huh. let me explain what I mean by that. Mm -hmm. When it comes to network strategy, which in my mind means how many facilities, how big, where should they be, and why, the math around that has been very similar. The approach to help companies determine that has been very similar for quite a long time. The biggest operating expenses, freight, labor, inventory management, inventory carrying costs, drive about 75% of the operating expense, and the real estate or lease cost is around five to 10% at the most. Mm -hmm. So it's really looking at those key cost levers and that's balanced by customer service expectations. How quickly do you need to be to your customer? And that's what's changed dramatically. Well, certainly those expectations have gone sky high. Sky high, because yeah. if you've been in this as long as we have, you know that many years ago, if you had six to eight distribution centers around the United States, that was very sufficient to meet your customer's demand. Mm -hmm. And today with Amazon and, and the impact of e-commerce, it's changed dramatically. Mm -hmm. Locations of facilities, size of facilities, how is that changing? Well, what we're seeing is a real move toward more facilities closer to the customer. And that's driven by, of course, this need to get there within two days or less, mm -hmm. as opposed to within three to five days, which it was maybe 10, 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. And so there's a definite trend toward more closer. Let's back it up to manufacturing because the logistics network or the distribution network or the warehouse network definitely tied inextricably to the manufacturing network as well. How is that changing? Is there indeed a resurgence of manufacturing in the United States, reshoring, nearshoring, whatever you want to call it, and how is that affecting the distribution network? Is that happening? Yeah, that's a great question. And I would tell you that the resurgence of manufacturing in North America, which includes Mexico, Canada, and the U.S., mm -hmm. is real and it makes sense. And we've seen a huge uptick in demand for manufacturing related project work. So uh, we're seeing that across different industries. Of course, as you know, the auto industry is going through a huge transformation to electric vehicles, battery production, and so on. That's having a big impact on manufacturing in the US. But we're also seeing it in areas like semiconductors, life sciences, in other industries uh, where you know we're trying to again to get it closer to the customer. Mm -hmm. And so that uptick in manufacturing in the US, I don't call it near shoring or reshoring, I call it a regionalization of manufacturing. So hmm. in my mind, when, when we're meeting and talking with supply chain executives, they're not using the term reshore or near shore because mm -hmm. it's not an all or nothing proposition. They're bringing a lot of that back. So it's a regionalization, I think America's APAC, EMEA. But it's real and it's happening and it's very exciting and driving a lot of change. But when you bring a plant home or wherever you put it, it's got to be serviced by a whole group of suppliers, multi-tier suppliers, and often those distribution facilities have to be sited accordingly. So does that mean that the warehouse network is also changing to support the changing manufacturing network? Does that mean more facility, more distribution facilities in this country as well? Or can they be over the border in Mexico? I mean, or is more all of the above? All of the above. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is, it's very exciting because if you build a big new electric vehicle plant or battery plant, yeah, it typically requires other suppliers to, to come up in and around you. And that creates more opportunity for, for distribution centers and so on. So it's a trickle down effect. Manufacturing and the resurgence of manufacturing has a huge positive demand on industrial real estate. Mm -hmm. Okay, but as you get closer to the customer, probably what you're doing is, am I right about this, you're creating smaller facilities, sometimes as small as so-called micro-fulfillment facilities, either in a store or near a store. You're in urban centers at that point, or more likely to be in urban centers with higher real estate costs? Is that is that causing the, the whole cost of real estate to go up because this is happening? Well, it's, it's interesting. Uh, the cost of real estate and the lease expense 
has gone up significantly over the last three years. Mm -hmm. And that's driven by this huge demand for industrial real estate, which was skyrocketed during COVID because, you know, obviously that's the only way to get product. Right. So we are seeing a really interesting move toward urban distribution, uh, urban you know distribution centers, multi-story distribution centers. The first one came up in Seattle. Uh, there's a few now in New York. There's one going up in Chicago right now as we speak. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, that's the first time we've ever seen multi-story distribution in urban areas in the United States within the last five years. The significance of that, I assume, is it because they have a smaller footprint, they need to go up. Is that right? Is that why they're multi-story? It's the cost factor. I see. And, mm -hmm. and the uh, availability of land factor in urban areas. Mm -hmm. that, that's what drives it. You have to go up. And that was never the case five or 10 years ago. Uh -huh. And so we're seeing that for the first time. Multi-story development in other parts of the world has been around for a long time. Yeah, I'm thinking of like facilities in Asia where you just have you know eight or nine different levels and that's the right. trucks go up and down all the time. And now we're going to start seeing that here. That's, yes, that's, it's very exciting. That's, that's very interesting. Yeah. Any other, uh, I mean, how do you see the future? Do you just see more of the same or what's it looking like to you in the whole real estate landscape as it relates to supply chain? Well, I think it's, uh, it, as I mentioned, the approach, the cost variables are very similar, although they change. As, as you know, labor has been a big challenge for companies. Right. So we're seeing a lot more automation in the, in the facilities. Uh, freight costs are, even though they came down a little bit after COVID, they're, they're going to continue to go up. And so that's always a huge consideration for companies and looking for maybe alternatives like intermodal and trying to locate within proximity of an intermodal facility as a way to hedge on transportation costs. Inventory carrying costs have gone up as interest rates are going up, mm -hmm. and that hasn't been the case for a long time. So uh, the, the dials change, but they're very similar dials. Yeah. Uh, the only, as I mentioned earlier, the big impact is on service, and you know it's gonna be coming increasingly more demanding for companies to deliver faster, cheaper, and that's going to mean more closer. Rich, thank you so much for your insights into what's going on in the real estate world as it relates to supply chain network strategy. Really appreciate that. But I want to take a moment to ask you about JLL specifically. What's going on with JLL these days and your position in the marketplace and what are you offering your, your own customer base? Well, Bob, thanks for asking. I mean, JLL is a well-kept secret, I think, especially with supply chain and operations people. We're a Fortune 200 company. We're one of the top global real estate firms in the world, but people don't know what we do, I don't think, uh, generally speaking. Mm -hmm. So the reason that we've invested and grown in our capability to help companies with supply chain strategy, as we've been talking, is because you know that's critical to their network, but you have to get it pinned to the ground. And so not only can we help on the consulting side in terms of how many, where should they be, how big and why, but we can also help to determine where you know where do you put it and get that executed, that could be overseeing construction, business and economic incentives, uh, and getting a lease executed and transacted. So it's kind of fun to help companies with strategy through the full range of execution services, mm -hmm. and that's where we think we can save them time, money, and mitigate risk. Rich, thank you so much once again for sitting down with me to talk about the uh, supply chain network strategy in general, as well as a little bit about JLL itself. Thanks very much. Bob, thanks for having me. I was speaking with Rich Thompson of JLL. Thank you very much for watching.